All right, so um, I was asked to just do some comparison analysis, I guess, of uh, SAVR versus TAVI. And uh, I guess uh, for this audience, you want me more to talk about the benefits of open AVR, so I will certainly bias my talk a bit that way. Although I started off in cardiology, went into cardiac surgery, and now I do both, and I, I have to be careful what I say about TAVR because I've got a team who does a lot of those. So we started off a very long time ago, getting involved with various transcatheter devices. And when this happened, the, of course, everybody thought this was going to be a confrontation between cardiology and cardiac surgery. Um, in the audience, I'm sure you'd identify with the leopard, but uh, cardiologists might uh, object to being identified with the warthog. But anyway, this is what it looked like. But after the initial studies, we all lay down and worked together, and everybody was hunky-dory. And for those of you at the back, that is photoshopped. That's not the way that things happen in nature. <laughs> the big issue in the United States is the cost of devices. Now, I don't know to what extent you're responsible for your costs, but we are very much responsible for our costs. And our reimbursement for a high-risk patient for TAVR is 62,000, 46,000 for without, and then you start adding up the, the lists of costs. Now, clearly over time, this is going to evolve, and potentially for those of you who are interventionists would love to see this, and it's doable. But the procedure cost for something like that is going to be in the region of 160 dollars to $200,000. And for example, the new Cook device, that alone is $29,000, apart from the support of the physicians. So looking forwards, there are a lot of challenges going ahead, and some of those aspects I'll touch on as far as transcatheter devices, and particularly TAVI. There are demand and market forces for us to use this more and more, and the industry certainly would love us to use this more, and then you have people who have financial incentives us using it. There's an issue of quality, regulatory, and cost issues, and I'll touch on a number of those. So in the United States, and I'm sure it's basically the same here, you've got a huge post-Second um, World War era of baby boomers, and they are going to be retiring. And for us in the United States, that's a huge increase in volume of patients who need procedures. And in this study from Mayo Clinic, about 12 to 13 percent of the elderly patients will have valve disease. At the same time in the United States, and I follow a lot of the newspapers here and the NHS and the challenges, you have similar problems. The um, health system and particularly government and commercial are struggling to pay for the costs of health care and including obviously the cost of the transcatheter devices, which will end up being about, in the United States, about four to six billion dollars, or about two to three percent of the budget. And my prediction is, and that's happening pretty quickly in the United States, and probably even more so now with President Trump, is that in uh, 10 years' time, 75 percent of health care costs in the United States will be covered by the government. At the same time, in this modified slide I put together, the incidence of particularly cardiovascular disease and coronary disease is declining in the United States. And in several of our states, the incidence of cancer causing death is now higher than cardiovascular disease. And this is particularly because of coronary artery disease and the changes related to that. And this includes both in females and in males. This is a slide I put together about three years ago on what's happening in healthcare in the United States. And on the left, you've got hospital care and outpatient care. Cardiac surgery will keep pace with the increase in population for hospital care. But outpatient care, the big transition is going to be to um, same day type of procedures. And this is a prediction for cardiothoracic surgery in the United States. It's going to continue to increase in partly because of the aging of the population. And the number of patients over the age of 65 is going to increase by 93% over the next 20 odd years.
And if you look at the other specialities, lung cancer and esophageal cancer, even bigger increases. But here's the decline in disease related to coronary artery disease. And so if you look at the outpatient procedures, other than cardiac surgery, which is obviously not at this stage, we are going to see more and more percutaneous procedures. And I predict that probably in 10 years' time, there will be places where percutaneous valves will be done as our patients' same-day discharge, and I can foresee that happening, and that will reduce the cost. So what's happening with some of the other procedures? Stents are obviously declining and used less, but percutaneous heart valves is going to be where the big increases are going to be, particularly the replacement valves are going forwards, and that I think everybody agrees. For the United States, TAVR volume is increasing uh, tremendously, and in the whole world, the market of TAVR is going to grow tremendously, but the rate of increase is going to slow down. And certainly for us, we've had a huge increase in percutaneous valves, and this last year, we had increased to 374 TAVRs. Now, the predictions were also that percutaneous hypertension procedures would increase, but obviously that was incorrect, but mitral valve is going to also increase. What's interesting, this is a Wall Street Journal article on where the investment is occurring, and investment in heart disease management is beginning now to slow, and other areas are increasing. <coughs> Locally, our biomedical engineering industry is booming in the Cleveland Clinic uh, area, and that's partly because our innovations uh, department. If you look at um, us at the Cleveland Clinic and the trend over times, this is our volume over time, and AVRs have been increasing. This is from a slide a few years ago, but as I showed you, more recently it's been stable. So one of the issues is the cost. Currently, um, in the United States, this is the best data I could find based on databases, is that about 92,000 aortic valve replacements are done every year in the United States, which costs half a billion dollars. As I said, this could increase to four to six billion dollars with the percutaneous valves. So most of our patients, we use biological valves. This is the Edwards uh, valve that we use, or the trifecta valve for small annuluses. So most patients get biological valves. Now, where you are in the world will depend what animal uh, valve you get. For those of you in the United States, biological valves, China, less biological, more mechanical. Yes, and this is a Photoshop map for you at the back again. Um, so the most of the patients we do as many Js, either first intercostal space or the fourth, and that allows us to do fairly complex procedures, and there's a patient a year after surgery. This happened to have been a patient with aortic dissection that I did through that. So we come to the issue of quality, and what you do at your institution is an ethical question. What are your outcomes? What are your best outcomes for TAV versus SAVR? And I think that is a key question for a lot of small hospitals in the United States. They're not going to manage to do complex re-operations, and TAVI may be the best for them. Whereas at a center where we, last year, did not have a death for a redo, re-operation for aortic valve, we will preferentially, if reasonable, still use SAVR. And I showed the slide earlier this morning that our mortality rate runs about a third to one quarter of STS outcomes, and that's part of the reason why we continue to have a strong program and open bowel surgery. And here's just some data on the reoperations with no mortality. And here's our volume with TAVR increasing over time, but our SAVR volume picked up and has remained stable. And here's our mortality rate over the last five years, 0.46%. Uh, our complication rate is low with a few deep stern wound infections and some stroke. This is for all the isolated AVRs, and that includes re-ops, endocarditis uh, group of patients. And so, hence, we've been fortunate to have the three-star rating. Now, what about percutaneous valves, then, as far as the outcomes? So, in our patients in the TAVR trials, the partner trials, we only had one death. 
and so our mortality rate was 0.4%. And this last year, with the 374 TAVARs, we only had one 30-day or in-hospital death. So that's the standard for us that we have to match SAVR versus TAVR or TAVI. Now, as I mentioned, that's 2016 data, so the slide for 2016 doesn't show the bar graph, but a very low mortality rate. So let me talk a bit about our outcomes then with mostly mini-invasive patients. This is from a few years ago, before the open use of TAVI, and you'll notice an AVR less than 70, the mortality rate was 0.22, and for many AVRs, 0.5. So that's the overall outcomes. It's really only in the patients undergoing reoperations over the age of 80 that we had an increased mortality rate prior to the TAVR period. What about intermediate risks? Since we're going to get to talk a bit about those trials, well, at the Cleveland Clinic, um, here are the numbers of high risk versus low risk, and if you look at the outcomes, no difference. And um, stroke rate was slightly higher in the intermediate risk, but otherwise no risk in mortality. And if you look at paravalvular leak, very low paravalvular leak rates in the patients done open. Another issue to deal with as far as long-term outcomes with TAVI versus SAVR is what is going to happen as far as the late deaths. Well, we looked at 13,000 patients who had AVRs at the Cleveland Clinic, and here's the mortality rate over time by age. So over age of 75, about two-thirds of those patients were alive five years after surgery. TAVR is not looking so good. And that's one of the questions that we need to address. <coughs> Excuse me. In our patients over the age of 80, the patients did better than the age match uh, population. Now, obviously, there's a selection issue in that. So surgical cost is another issue, and that's why we do a lot of repairs. We talked about this this morning. So what about then direct matching of TAVR versus SAVR. And here's our mortality rates over time, but I don't show the 2016 data. So let's talk a bit about the randomized trials. And this is the intermediate risk, partner 2A. And this is the study that we designed for looking at the intermediate risk patients, 232 patients, 2032 randomized then into the transfemoral or transapical arms or alternative access, and then matched over time. Well, what the data show? <clears throat> if you take both groups, there was no difference in survival, either early or late. Now, it is true that in the transfemoral patients, there was a slight benefit in the transfemoral group. But if you take both study groups, which was the a priori way that we put the study together, there was no difference in intermediate risk. So. As part of that, we also did a separate study where we took the patients from the 2A, so that was the second large study, elective a reasonable risk patient, and intermediate, and compared it to a registry of the S3 valve and compared those. Well, what did that show? Well, there you there was a benefit. Now Many of you have seen this paper, and I know this paper is used a lot by the cardiologists, but there are a number of problems with the study having been involved with it. First of all, the definitions of what we used for propensity matching was defined by the FDA with some negotiation with um, the company and us. So the variables were preset. Ejection fraction was not one of those variables, which clearly is a very important variable. And then on top of that, in the 2A surgical arm, which was a matching arm, in that study we had no commercial valves available for putting the high risks. So high risk patients were included in the 2A intermediate arm. In the S3 study, the commercial valves were available. So anybody who was high risk would typically go into commercial, whereas the true intermediates were in the S3. So I personally don't feel that this is a reasonable comparison. And um, so it's out there, but I don't think it was a reasonable comparison. So TAVI 
initially it was aimed for 2,500 patients, but enrollment was a problem and ACC coming up now in a week's time, we will see the results of the 1,600. So FDA allowed them to end the trial early and we'll see what those results show for intermediate risk. So part of the problem is we're basically dealing with two bell curves. And when you have a lot of noise and two bell curves fairly close to each other, it's very difficult to get separation. And I don't think we're going to get separation. And now when we're doing the S3 trial, that will be another issue. So there are two low-risk trials. There's the partner three, and that's STS less than four. And then the core valve low risk, which is STS less than three. And these trials are being done, and I think the final result is going to be that there's going to be very little difference between the two. Another issue is the long-term follow-up. So we are hoping that we will have enrolled patients um, fairly reasonably and have by October 2018 some initial data. But the final completion date for analysis will only be in 2027, 2027, sorry. So we won't know the late outcomes for a long term and for a long time either in these patients. And that gets us back to some of the issues about durability of these valves. So there are some differences between the two trials. Uh, partner three is one year death stroke and readmission, which I fought, but it's there. So that's going to be one of the criteria. So the valve, um, the study is somewhat biased, I think, as far as the transfemoral, and this is just transfemoral. And core valve, it's one year, they're allowed to check the outcomes, and then the final analysis is two years and includes stroke. So let's look about a bit of low risk and as far as TVT. So TVT is the National Registry of Commercial Devices put in to patients in CMS over the age of 65 in the United States. The overall mortality um, a year or so ago was 7%, STS 7.1. So it tracks basically the STS score pretty well. Partner three, our average STS score is about two. And my guess is the mortality rate will come in somewhere in the region of 1.5 to 2% for both groups without much separation. So here are some of the other issues with real life, and that is that a lot of the patients from the trials uh, are excluded, uh, and um, so there's an issue with that. So transfemoral, obviously severe peripheral vascular disease, the patients are not included. Ejection fraction less than 20% are not included, and we know those patients do very well with open surgery, endocarditis, et cetera. So there are a lot of exclusions for patients. And if you look at our initial trials, a partner trial, the failure rate by VARC definitions was 20% of patients. So not everybody is getting what they'd like to have. And so you will continue to have this issue of two bell curves for outcomes. And I maintain that AVR is going to be the lower risk, especially in the hands of good surgeons. And then there'll be some o overlap in the patients with TAV and those surgeons and those institutions who will be labeled as somewhat bad surgeons. So what about long-term? So why is TAV not having better long-term survival rates? Well, there are a number of issues. Um, I think, and I see it in our high-risk uh, group, that patients with coronary artery disease or severe mitral valve regurgitation or TR, the, the sort of approach is, well, this patient's an elderly patient, we can always treat the coronary artery disease later, and we're sure the mitral valve regurgitation and TR will improve. But I think it's paying out now in the statistics of long-term survival and that these patients are having more problems. And not so long ago at our m and we had a patient who was done at St. Elsewhere and had severe mitral valve stenosis and regurgitation. They put an aortic valve. Needless to say, they didn't treat the mitral valve, which in fact was made worse by having a TAVA, and now we had to reoperate on the patient. And that's a great danger, that patients are not going to get the procedure they um, should be getting. There's obviously a case selection issue, but I think that there are a number of potential issues. What about long-term durability? So freedom from reoperation, this is a study I did in uh, patients comparing the patients who had repair, um, and this is tricuspid valve repair in gray there, 
versus bicuspid valve and open AVR with a biological valve. And you won't see for the failures for the first 10 years after insertions probably of the TAVR. We just did a study on the five-year outcomes with TAVR and there's no difference between surgery and uh, percutaneous valves. The big issue, as many of you know, was the Euro PCR presentation when at seven years, 50% of patients had evidence of degeneration based on VARC definitions. Now, this, the problem with this study was that it was by reports, so echo reports, paper reports. It was not by study of the VELs. So that's why it's been heavily criticized and it hasn't been published, although I've talked to uh, John Webb about this and he is working on publishing the paper. You've also heard about uh, Raj Makar's paper on th clot thrombosis on the valves, and certainly that seems to be something more common with TAVR. It certainly happens with the open AVRs, and we certainly see that occasionally. There was a very nice paper recently from the Mayo Clinic in Jack showing that if you put patients on Coumadin who have clot on the valves after open AVR, 83% of those patients, their gradients will go down. Uh, with Coumadin and the clot will resolve. And here's just some more of those pictures. So at the Cleveland Clinic, we looked at uh, 12,000 AVRs, uh, and this was particularly with the Edwards valve. And obviously in the younger the patients, the greater the greater failure. But in the elderly patients, the risk of failure is very low. So once again, we get back to the issue, will we sh show or see any difference in durability of 10 years? We may not see much of a difference. If you look at the uh, valve and valve registries, uh, most of the patients are actually requiring valve and valve at about seven to 11 years, which is at a lower age than we would have expected. And once again, we'll see what happens. I've been involved in two research trials, both the partner trial and the TV trial, and that data will be coming out shortly, showing a very low mortality rate for valve and valve. So that certainly is going to become a good option for a lot of patients. There have been some legal questions around the, the TAVA and TAVI. Um, Medtronic had to pay a $114 million penalty to Edwards because of breach of the Anderson uh, patent, which is now expired. And the Maryland court basically set up a cartel where Medtronic cannot compete with Edwards and pays royalty to Edwards. The Krebia patent will soon be expiring, but under that also Medtronic had to pay a big fee to Edwards. So one of the moral questions for society, I know that you're struggling with here in Britain, is how are you going to pay for all of this? And you have NICE, your committee that assesses this, and I know it's been very conservative on the percutaneous valves. And we have the same issues in the United States with the growing population of the elderly. In the partner um, B trial, we looked at costs of putting these procedures and doing these procedures. It came out at $78,000 per procedure. And the amount of life gained was 1.59 years. Now, this was the high risk non operable patients. And about $50,000 per year of life gain, which actually is a pretty reasonable cost when you look at all the procedures we do. For example, obviously. Something like an LVAD is, is about $250,000 per year gained. If you look at some of the data here from Europe, uh, this is the study by Ruben and uh, Osnaburger. The costs add up pretty quickly also in Europe for the uh, patients who have the percutaneous valves. On top of that, if a patient has a complication, the risk or the rate of increase in cost is quite substantial. And obviously, with pacemakers, you add about seven to ten thousand dollars per patient in extra costs. And if you have to do a repeat TAVR, that basically doubles the expense of a TAVR. And then, if you use filters, um, the we've been involved in Samia Kapadia, one of our cardiologists, read uh, led the trial on the Sentinel study. The filtering devices appear to work and that adds a cost also apart from the pacemakers in, these, in this population. 
Let me go back to a study we did a long time ago because it's kind of interesting, and, and that is the cost of healthcare management. Many of you know that if you stop a patient from smoking, that patient will cost the healthcare system less than if you stop them smoking. Similarly, if you look at patients with aortic valve stenosis who are not treated, they will cost the system much less. And so when we did this study many years ago, looking at the CMS Medicare patient population, if they had aortic valve, over the next five years, apart from incurring about a $50,000 cost of the procedure, open AVR, the cost of managing a patient over the next five years was doubled. And so that's one of the challenges of healthcare. Healthcare is very effective in taking care of patients, but it makes it more expensive. Back in 2015, the US market for TAVA was about $2.6 billion. And these are old numbers, but um, CBO, which is the government organ accounting organization in the United States, worked out in 2015 for the hospital care in the United States that cost about $205 billion. If we're going to increase the cost by adding percutaneous valves of 2 to 5 percent of hospital budgets, that's going to be a challenge to healthcare, not only here in Britain, but also in the United States. We certainly face a lot of other challenges. Um, analysts uh, recently did an analysis and came up with similar numbers on their analysis on what the costs. They expect that there will be a big increase and add about $4.3 billion to the US uh, healthcare costs. What does the government think? Well, the government thinks they're going to cut costs. And if you read the CBO budget, which I've done, and I've got the latest one to read through, they expect they're going to cut healthcare costs. How are they going to do that? Well, here are the proposals. And basically, they don't call it rationing, but it's rationing. And they are hoping to restrict care of patients by cutting costs, by reducing availability of procedures to patients. And I notice <coughs> now NHS here, the newspapers are full about reducing the cost of doing hips and knees for patients and rationing that, which is not an expensive procedure as compared to the percutaneous valves. CMS already is beginning to ratchet down the payments for valve procedures. So for TAVA, they reduced um, that amount. And um, they, for SAVR, they increased it with the idea, I suspect, that they're trying to game the situation a bit by having more patients having SAVR versus TAVA. So there are a lot of issues, and I don't know what the future holds. It's, we certainly have a very good procedure. It's very effective for patients. How you choose that for your patients will depend on your own institutional outcomes. And the big challenge for society, both here in Europe, Britain, I guess now is, with Brexit is going to be separate, but Britain and America is paying for these procedures. And that's for society and the politicians to debate. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.